Lawrence Krauss is a down-to-earth cosmologist who knows empty space has stuff in it, and it's likely star stuff and earth stuff are largely the same, yes. In fact, my two hands are likely made from star stuff from two different stars. Krauss debates the intelligent ones, the professors and public intellectuals who ponder questions like, is there something from nothing, and if so, why is there something rather than nothing? Lawrence Krauss is a theoretical physicist, a cosmologist, a YouTube star of sorts a foundation professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University and the director of the Origins Project at the university. His new book is called A Universe from Nothing. Why is there something rather than nothing? It is my pleasure to welcome Lawrence Krauss to Studio 4 to tell us more. It's a pleasure to be here. I don't know what you meant of sorts, though, but anyway. <laughs> of sorts? Well, I watched you debate uh, Richard Dawkins, uh -huh. uh, the... Uh, uh, rude atheist, well, or whatever we can call him. He's a pleasant enough fellow. He's a committed atheist. Yeah. He was here. Yeah. We had a good time. But I watched you debate him on YouTube, and apparently millions others, millions of others did too. Yeah, no, that's true, I guess. Did he call you the Woody Allen of physics? He called me the Woody Allen of physics, yeah. So that's, that seems to have captured. That was nice. It's mm -hmm. nice. That a lot of people have called me other things. So I, I, I bet, yeah. like your mother. Yes, my, yes, yeah. You don't want mm -hmm. to know what she called me. <laughs> Did you come from a smart family, a, a science family, an I didn't artsy come from a, family? I did, my, neither of my parents actually uh, graduated from high school. Um, um, they, my, they weren't a science family. Uh, my mother's idea of science was for me to be a doctor, and that's what she mm -hmm. really wanted me to be, and was very disappointed, for, very disappointed for a long time that I wasn't a doctor. But she's come to grips with it now. Mm -hmm. When did physics grab you? Well, you know, I, th I read books by physicists when I was a kid, uh, by scientists in general, because my mother, in fact, had told, you know, said if you want to be a doctor, you have to be a scientist. And so um, I read books by Albert Einstein and George Gamow and people mm -hmm. like that, and, and that really grabbed me. And, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I write books now, I think, is to return the favor. And it happens because I'm old enough that I've written books that someone comes up to me and says, you know, I read this book by you, and that caused me mm -hmm. to be a scientist. And I, it's kind of a great thing to hear. Yes, well, I think it was Rumi who said, uh, I look at these worlds spinning out of nothingness, and that is your power. Whoa, well. So back to the nothing thing. Yes. Uh, big question. A uh, very big question. Why there is something rather than nothing? And in the front it says, where did the universe come from? Other big question. What was there before it? And what will the future bring? You know, these are the, the funny thing is, these are the questions that everyone asks themselves. We, we drum them out of people. You know, everyone's basically a scientist when they're young. And they ask these questions about the universe, and then we sort of either force them to stop asking them, or we divert those questions to religion and say those questions are only answered by the existence of God. But the question is, why is there something rather than nothing is really a scientific question, which is what I try to describe in the book. It's not a religious or theological question because something and nothing are physical quantities. And mm -hmm. the amazing thing about physics in the last 20 or 30 years is that we've completely changed our picture of the universe. And so, you know, while I can confront theologians in this book, what I really want to do is celebrate the knowledge we have. The, it's a positive thing. Rather than, it's, what is remarkable is the fact that it's even plausible that we can now actually, as physicists, describe a plausible scenario for how the universe came from nothing. It's kind of the equivalent of, of in some sense, and, and, and in fact, Richard Dawkins is kind enough in the afterward to make a comparison mm -hmm. to Origin of the Species, but it's kind of what like Darwin did in the sense that before Darwin, life was a miracle. There's no way you could understand the diversity of life. Mm -hmm. And he showed plausible mechanisms, which we now understand to be true, except in a few states in, like Arkansas and <laughs> yes. other places. A few presidential <laughs> yeah, candidates Yeah, a few presidential candidates. Exactly, exactly. But in, in the real world, we know it's true. And, uh, and he, but he showed that plausible route. And it is, it is amazing to me that it's even plausible that we can actually nowadays know, know enough about the universe to know that it could have come from nothing. And in fact, when we look at it, it has all the properties of a universe that did come from nothing. And how do you define nothing? Well, that's a good question. And in fact, I, I, I would argue that the scientific definition of nothing is a little more careful than the theologians. And the first definition of nothing might be what it, what it would have been in the Bible, eternal empty void, mm. empty space, darkness. And I think for many people, that would be a good definition of nothing until I tell them that something can come from that. Because in, in the real world, in the world of physics as we now understand it, empty space isn't so empty. It's a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles that pop in and out of existence mm -hmm. in a time scale so short you can't see them. And in fact, that kind of nothing, due to the laws of quantum mechanics, is unstable. 
it will always produce stuff naturally by the known laws of physics. And so for some reason, people, when I tell them that's nothing, and they say, well, that can't be nothing because that can create something. So <laughs> right. there's, there's space there. What about, you know, mm -hmm. nothing really has no space. And then I tell them that if you apply the laws of quantum mechanics to gravity, you can actually create universes and spaces where there were no spaces before. And, that, and, and so we keep going on and on and on. And I like to say that the theologians say that I, I, my definitions of nothing are not the right ones, but I like to say that they're experts at nothing. Well, you do. <laughs> I bet you do. But you also say there is stuff in empty space, bottom line. Yeah, well, th well there's, depends what you mean by stuff. There, empty space, <laughs> oh, that. what I mean by empty space is something where there's no measurable stuff. You can't, you, you take away, you take some region mm -hmm. of space and you get rid of all the particles and all the radiation, so there's nothing you can measure there. But what is really one of the greatest discoveries of the last century, and I'm, I'm happy to say I played a role in it, it's astounding that we've discovered when you take that empty space, it weighs something. It actually has energy. In fact, most of the energy of the universe resides in empty space. It's the biggest mystery in science. Mm. We don't understand why it is, but 70% of the energy of the entire universe resides in nothing. How do you weigh empty space? Well, you weigh it using gravity. Gravity is the oh. way I can weigh you using gravity. I wouldn't do it now, but I could. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it turns out the really strange thing is if you put energy in empty space, it has, it's gravitationally repulsive. It, 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 instead of attractive, mm. everything else in, in gravity is all, as I like to say to high school students, gravity sucks. We always know gravity pulls, it never pushes. Mm -hmm. But if you put energy in empty space, it's the only thing you can show using the equations of Einstein and general relativity that it's gravitationally repulsive. It's, it's like anti-gravity. And what we've done is weigh the universe and see that in fact the expansion of the universe is speeding up, not slowing down, as any sensible universe would do because gravity would normally mm -hmm. slow the expansion of the universe. And the big surprise about 10 years ago was the discovery that the expansion of the universe is getting faster and faster and faster. And the only way to understand that is if empty space has energy. And if there is more than one universe, well, it, and, or not? And, well, there may be. I mean, all of these things lead to the possibility that our universe is not unique. Of course, we can't prove that. No. It's a speculation. Probable, but, improbable. Well, I'd say it's probable. And that's what we can do in science. We can say whether something's probable or improbable in general. Mm -hmm. We don't have absolute truths in science, unlike religion. That's the reason that science makes progress because we can change our minds. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really important thing that we, we, as I often say, if you're a theoretical physicist, the two most important states to be in are either wrong or confused. Because <laughs> that means there's a lot left to learn. A lot <laughs> left to learn. Uh, do we start with an atom? What do we start with? Well, we, the atoms are pretty big. We start with, uh, I mean, but atoms, of course, exhibit the properties of quantum mechanics, which has really changed our picture of the universe. Mm. In fact, quantum mechanics is so strange that it seems impossible. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the prime examples of a fact that I like to talk about in the book too, which is that the universe is the way it is whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to, it, it may not seem logical to you, but that just means you have to redefine what you mean by logic. A, on, a, on an atomic level, atoms and, and electrons, the particles, that one of the particles that make up atoms, do strange things. Electrons act like they're spinning, but like a spinning top. But unlike a spinning top, because they're quantum mechanical, they're spinning in all directions at the same time, which is crazy. How can something spin in all directions at the same right. time? But it does, and we can verify that by experiment, that it's, it's doing many different things at the same time. In fact, uh, when I take a baseball and I throw it to you, it, it follows some trajectory. Mm -hmm. But if I took an electron and I, I sent it for me to you, it would actually follow all paths at the same time. It would take a straight line, it would go around, it would go to the moon and back, all of which it would do at exactly the same time. Now that defies the laws of conventional logic and wisdom, but mm -hmm. conventional logic and wisdom have to go out the window because we have to f force ourselves to accept reality, or force our minds to conform to the evidence of reality rather than the other way around. And, and so quantum mechanics is stranger than you can imagine, but it happens to be true. It, it describes the world at these subatomic levels and, or atomic levels, and, and it is amazing to me that we have been able to discover how that world behaves, but once we realize how it behaves, it has great implications for our universe. Because if our universe is expanding, mm -hmm. which it is. Rapidly. It was rapidly, but it was much, much smaller. And we can trace it back. And we know that 13.72 billion years ago, which is amazing that we can even pinpoint it like that, the entire universe was contained in a region smaller than the size of a single atom. Mm. 
And the question is, will it go away as fast as it came? Well, you know, it, in fact, it'll, we think it'll go. In fact, came. in fact, Christopher Hitchens, who is, who is going to be writing the forward for the book before he got too ill, I, when I told him about the expansion of the universe, how eventually all the galaxies we now see will be moving away from us faster than the speed of light, and the rest of the universe will disappear before our very eyes. Not before our very eyes, because no. it'll take a few hundred billion years to do okay. it. Okay, so I won't have, be here. You don't have to worry or about it. Or maybe a part of me will be <laughs> here. A part of you will still be there somewhere in the universe doing things. In fact, that's what's amazing about our atoms. I wrote a whole book about our atoms and, and, and where they come from mm -hmm. and where they're going. And, the, and, and they'll still be around, in, but in a, on a, around a different planet, around a different star with a different civilization. Those astronomers will look out and they'll think they live in the universe we lived in a hundred years ago. Only 100 years ago, in less than 100 years ago, we only knew of one galaxy in the universe. We now the know Milky that there are Way. Yeah, but we now know there are 400 billion galaxies. Right. Well, we thought it was static. That's what I learned in school. We I don't know what you learned well, in school. We, well, yeah, well I, I'm not sure what I learned in school, but uh, <laughs> I, I didn't believe anything my teachers told me. Mm -hmm. So that was, and that's probably a good thing, in fact. But, but now we know there are hundreds of billions of galaxies, and the universe is expanding in a single human lifetime. Our picture of the universe has changed more than you could possibly have imagined. And that's why we're like the early map makers. We're just beginning to understand the universe on its largest scales. And it's not too surprising. We're surprised all the time. But we're not the center of the universe. That's clear. Well, I, my friends have to remind me that on, on a daily basis, actually. But, <laughs> <laughs> but we are not the center of the universe. It's kind of, I, I have some, some demonstrations in the book because it's pretty hard. We look at, out at galaxies and we see that every galaxy is moving away from us. So it feels like we're the center. But that's just an accident of our circumstance. It turns out there is no center of the universe. You, well, it depends if you're an optimist or a pessimist. Either mm. there is no center or every place is the center. You can decide which you like better. But mm -hmm. the bottom line is that the universe is the same everywhere, as far as we can tell, and it looks the same from every place. I mean, local changes. I mean, we're here and we're not over there, but there's as much mass in that direction as that direction. The universe is, is the same in every direction. And we're not alone. We figured that out, or I don't think we're alone. Well, you, don't, you say we're not alone. Uh, we're, the likelihood we that we're alone possibly is... possibly be alone. It's hard to imagine. I mean, given that there are over 100 billion stars in our galaxy, we now have learned that most of those stars have planets around them, so solar systems. 100 billion galaxies with all those stars and galaxies. And we also know that there's lots of water out there, organic molecules, and sunlight, which is all that was necessary for life to evolve here on Earth. So it's hard to imagine it hasn't evolved well, and, somewhere else. And most life is underwater. Un in fact, well, water seems to be essential for the development of life. Mm. And so that's why when we look for life on other planets, like when we look for the existence of fossils on fossilized life on Mars, which we'll do, we're, we're, we're doing it because we realize there's water there. Right. And okay. So and, and under the oceans of Europa, the, 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 we think there may be life because it's kind of like the, the, a drunk who comes out of a bar and loses his keys. Where does he look? He looks under the lamppost. Why? <laughs> Not because he's likely to fall there, but that's where he's likely to find them. So exactly. we're looking for life in the most obvious places. There may be life that's very different than the life on Earth, but if you're going to look for it, you look for the place where at least you know it's likely to be. And, sure. and I would be very surprised if in the next decade we didn't discover evidence of at least fossilized life uh, in, in the solar system. Interesting. Uh, who or what put us together is the question. Well, you know, that's, but it's interesting. We always have to ask, say that who, who word. Mm -hmm. A lot of things get put together without any hue, like snowflakes, right? The beautiful mm -hmm. snowflakes come in. It's, I don't think you think that someone's up there designing them in the sky every, every minute. <laughs> yes, I do. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> oh, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I know, I figured. But the, the, the point is that lots of amazing things happen simply because of the mm -hmm. laws of nature. And, and we want to ask that question, how do we get here? And, and it is amazing that when we trace things back to the early moments of the Big Bang, we can understand how what processes produce galaxies and matter from nothing and ultimately atoms and ultimately us and we even are getting close enough to try and understand what can produce a universe from yes, nothing our chemical beginnings our chemical beginnings and before that even, even before there was chemistry before there were atoms mm -hmm. before there were even elementary particles and i find it amazing that here we are in this random planet in this random place in the middle of nowhere and we have through our minds and and the fact that we're graced with consciousness been able to understand the, early, the universe to the earliest moments of the Big Bang. I think it's worth celebrating. These are ideas that are fascinating. Part of the benefit of science, we always talk about technology, and of course, science is responsible for everything in this room almost. But, but for me, science is as important for its ideas and its impact on our culture. It's like great art and literature and music. It, it's, it, what's, it's what makes being human worth being human. Mm -hmm. but, and it, but as you know, so many people uh, uh, believe it is evil. 
to talk about it, to talk about uh, 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 their, the possibility there was not a god. And when we come back, we'll talk about okay. that. A universe from nothing, Lawrence Krauss, our guest, he's a physicist.